Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very special episode of Recyclist. I'm your host, Eric Provost, and today I'm being joined by an incredibly special guest, the esteemed CEO of Diamond Scientific, recent inductee into the Swana Landfill Gas and Biogas Hall of Flame, Ramon Rivera. Thank you so much for joining me today, sir. Thank you, Eric. It's a real pleasure to be able to sit down with you today and uh, just have a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And the the big thing that we're here to discuss today is this idea of renewable natural gas. We're seeing it all over the news, especially recently with a ton of companies starting to go all in on this idea and the and the prospects and and the potential that we see with it. But I think there's still some confusion around I mean even basically what it is. So when it comes to renewable natural gas, RNG, uh, as it's called, how would you describe it to, to people who who are unfamiliar with the concept? Let me start with uh, a little history. Okay. And the history dates back to uh, the mid-80s when EPA enacted rules for landfills to manage both their gas systems and their leachate, which is their dirty water, the wastewater that uh, is generated as a result of landfilling. And we knew then, back in the mid-80s, that these sites, these landfill sites, were nothing more than these energy pods, if you will. You know, we've been <clears throat> dumping waste for hundreds of years in this country. As a matter of fact, uh, Manhattan is... Uh, part of a landfill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People don't re realize sometimes. And, you know, we, f we see the potential now because uh, we're starting to pay attention to uh, air quality and the off gases that come off of uh, not only landfill uh, sites, but also uh, agricultural sites and general production sites where uh, we have uh, operations in agriculture that uh, use corn to make fuel and so forth. So when we go back to the history, uh, we started then capturing gas and using that gas in landfills to um, contain them, number one, from off-gassing. And essentially, the first sites were nothing more than flares. And if you remember those landfills, if you were driving down the highway, especially on the east coast of the U.S., you'd see these little flares at night on these hills. And people used to flare off that gas. We've, we've become, we became so sophisticated in that technology that we realized that we could capture that gas and use that gas to power engines that would in turn produce uh, energy for not only the landfill site, uh, a lot of landfill sites today use that energy from their landfills to power collection equipment, operational equipment, and most of them today, the bigger sites, are feeding into the electrical grid. So it started there back in the 80s and now uh, as we've progressed and we've, we've realized that there's this huge potential for uh, capturing this gas, we've gotten uh, these private corporations now have gotten some funding from, federal, from the federal dollars, which allows them to use this capital to expand their operations. And we're starting to see now that some of these landfill sites are generating high uh, kilowatt hours uh, and producing such good, clean gas to the grid um, that we're starting to replicate that throughout the country. Uh, so th that, that's sort of the, the background and the history. And But would it be fair to say that just, you know, just in lay terms, this idea of renewable natural gas, this noxi ga noxious gas given off by landfills and, and other sites that we used to just burn off, as it was released, now we can just collect it and now we can refine it and clean it and turn it into a renewable energy source. It's, it, that's true. I mean, it's, a, it's, not an, it's not an easy process mm -hmm. because you have other types of gas that are a result of 
the product, the byproduct of, of these operations. I mean, ideally, we're trying to source CH4, which is methane. Mm-hmm. And that's a clean fuel for us. But we also find that because of the mixed, the waste composition and landfill specifically, we get high concentrations of, of, of hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide. And so these types of gases have to be dealt with. And so that's where the technology has advanced to the point that we're able to get uh, the methane to higher concentrations. Typically in the past, we were getting 40 to 50 uh, percent of the uh, gases in, in, in land, methane gases in these landfills. Now we're seeing upwards of 60 percent. And in these, these sites, where we're starting to use media, which is nothing more than a cleaning product to clean the sulfides out, we're getting 90%. And when we hit those higher numbers, that's when we're starting to see the electric companies say, yeah, this is good enough for us to use uh, in, our, in our power generation facilities. And so now we're starting to see that happen more and more. Yeah, as a matter of fact, here in Brevard County, where you and I call home, uh, Brevard County actually uses landfill gas to power part of the county grid, don't they? They do. They do actually. They have a third-party contractor, and then, and 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 because the capital is so intensive, uh, a lot of uh, these sites and operations are using third-party contractors ap- to actually operate the power plant. Uh, within a landfill and or even in a dairy farm operation or an agricultural operation. And because they know that business, you know, typically, you know, the, 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 the people in the landfill side know landfill business, the people in agriculture know the dairy business and or agriculture or whatever it is that uh, they're working at. But they're, they're starting to understand the industry, but that's not their core business. So there's a lot of third-party operators out there now that uh, do an excellent job and um, are operating these these uh, these energy sites on, on, on landfills and at uh, agricultural facilities like in Brevard County. And, um, you know, most landfills release this gas, CH4, methane, hydrogen sulfide, uh, so, do you think it's fair to say that most landfills across the country have the capability to turn their gas into renewable natural gas? Well, that's a very good question, Eric. The, the problem we have, of course, is that as landfills age mm-hmm. and as they're closed, we see diminishing amounts of gas produced because the biodegradation of the waste is occurring and at some point we just get to a point uh, specifically in a landfill that the the site just doesn't generate enough gas to sustain the cost, the capital cost involved with operating, you know, a facility that will capture that gas. But in terms of landfills that are still active, landfills that are still accepting gas, would you think that that's that this is still a very good prospect worth looking into for most sites? Oh, it is absolutely, and, and uh, again, it's it's based on on volumes and how much landfills in the site. But I would suggest that because today it's so difficult mm-hmm. to site not only a landfill site but a wastewater facility because we're, we're operating now in wastewater facilities uh, and or an agricultural facility that they become mega sites. They're, they're very large regional sites. And because of that, yes, uh, most sites today, uh, if they're operating and have those permits in place, absolutely, they're, they, they, sh- they should be if they're not uh, capturing this valuable waste stream uh and uh, obviously we've seen a lot more like we mentioned at the the top uh we've seen a lot more companies start to produce more and more projects start to open up more and more sites uh, and open up more and more anaerobic digesters 
So what, in terms of like the future of renewable natural gas, what do you think is the future? And what do you think, what would you like to see capitalized on? I, I think we're just scratching the surface. Really? I, th- I think that we've had, you know, when we looked at these sites 40 years ago, we knew they would be mining sites in the future, meaning that if you look at a landfill today, um, there's st- still a lot of metal in there. Mm-hmm. There's st- still a lot of material that you re- you can recover. So at some point in the future, I suspect that some of these sites are going to be mined for what's left, what's valuable. Once we are able to say, yeah, um, this anaerobic digestion has occurred, we've, we've We've been able to capture as much of this gas as we can. What's left for this site? I would say that uh, beyond parks, we're seeing a lot of these closed sites used for parks or for solar uh, solar farms. But beyond that, I, I personally believe that we'll start mining these in the future. And I suspect we'll start doing that uh, in, certainly in your lifetime. <laughs> well, th- renewable natural gas just has so many different applications. We've seen it. Uh, I mean, we've already you've already mentioned about how the the gas and the energy gets put right back into running the landfill itself. But we've also talked about how it can be refined and pushed right back into a county grid. We've seen uh, different people create renewable uh, vehicle fuel with it. So. Do you feel like the sky's the limit just in terms of the potential applications of this fuel, and that is why people are so excited about it? Um, well, in, in, you know what? It, it, it causes, allows us to, fall, to have full integration uh, in, of the waste stream. And what that means is we have a cradle-to-grave mentality when we manage these sites, meaning that we know when it's generated, where it's going to go, and then we know where we're going to treat it, dispose of it. But those residuals now have become a valuable uh, commodity for us. And absolutely, I don't think this is just going to end with uh, uh, the, the progress we've made. I think as the technology improves, the cost of these uh, uh, sites will come down. The the technicians, the talent pool that's needed for these sites. You know, it's not easy for a company to have a fully trained technician that works all day uh, taking readings. And we're starting to see companies, uh, specifically uh, low-key controls, for example, who operates these automatic measuring systems for wells. And one of the things you need when I talk about wells, each one of these sites has individual wells. And what you want to do is you set these wells in a grid pattern so they extract waste from that particular sector of the landfill site. Okay, and so that that gas is then vacuumed in, and that wellhead needs to be tuned. And for the last 40 years, we've been tuning those manually, and now we're starting to see some automatic tuning of those wellheads, and that's made a huge impact um, in in the ability of of not only controlling the the quality of the way uh, of the gas coming out of there, but also the ability to, to uh, better manage manpower because um, it's a tough job and it's hard to get people placed in that job. Yeah, that's a good point because uh, just on the surface you have the the direct uh, effects where you have capturing the, the gas, cleaning it, and then putting it back into. Uh, putting it back into use but you look at the second and third order effects that you just touched on companies that create technology to make this process more efficient to make it more viable for other companies i think there's also a big opportunity there uh, because we already have the capabilities but doubling down on that i think uh, 
you, you talked about the, just how much the technology has advanced. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to open up some big opportunities for companies in the future, not just for landfills to capture this gas, but for other companies to create new technologies, new attractive technologies to make that an even more viable, even more efficient, even more economical uh, option for people. So we're, you know, the industry itself in the last five years has grown so fast. And when I speak about the industry, I'm talking about the renewable natural gas business Mm -hmm. has grown so fast that it's hard to keep up with uh, who the new players are. And of course, we've had uh, most recent administration uh, grant dollars uh, with the help of our Senate and Congress to fun projects which is needed and they're starting to see everyone is starting to see the value in doing this you know one of the things that uh, we hadn't talked about is that you know these sites have a tendency to off gas odors and by better managing the gas you control that i mean there's you know, I've often said, look, the waste companies, wastewater plants, you know, agriculture, so people got to eat. They they have to dispose of their water. They have to, or the wastewater, they have to dispose of their garbage. Where does it go? Well, it just doesn't miraculously go away. And, you know, unfortunately, both cities, counties, and private companies have been targeted, um, but they weren't generating the waste. They're just managing it. Mm -hmm. And so now, because of the ability to better manage these gas systems, we're starting to see uh, better uh, equipment used to to control odors and actually manage odors and to, to monitor those odors. So we, in the past, we, historically, we hadn't had you know, perimeter monitoring equipment that could measure uh, air quality. But we're there today. You know, that technology's happened just in the last three years, basically. So in terms of people, it's like, oh, this sounds like a really good idea. Uh, Maybe this is something I should look into. Hey, I work for a company or I work at a site where this may be a viable option for us uh, to help with uh, our, you know, the gas that uh, we generate and maybe get us a little money on the side. What advice, what would you recommend to people as kind of a base level? Okay, where do I begin? What do I start looking into? What technology or companies do I start looking at? You know, including Diamond Scientific. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you know, the best source, uh, I believe, is probably the Renewable Natural Gas Coalition. Um, that that has all the key players in the United States that are involved, and we we've got a lot of our all the all the North American players, both from Canada, Mexico, and the Americas has now some players. But a lot of the technology had been in place in Europe, and so now our European partners have shown up with all this technology they've used for years. We know that. You know, when you travel Europe, they don't have the, the land mass we have. And so they've been controlling waste, controlling energy much better than we have for years. And so because of th- those companies showing up now on our, uh, in our shores with these technologies, we've implemented and or we're using some of those technologies, but making it more American, if you will, because our waste streams are different. Uh, in that when you look at, you know, we've done some waste uh, characterization, if you will, of waste streams. And we know that a waste that the waste stream an American generates and a waste stream that, for example, Central American gener- generates or a waste stream that a European generates are all different. Yeah. We buy different. Uh, we throw things out differently. And... Um, you know, so because of that, we have to adapt this equipment that comes in from Europe uh, or these other technologies to make them work for our type of waste streams. 
And uh, in terms of just the, the breadth of uh, the industry and where it could potentially go from here, the, uh, the this idea of renewable natural gas is not going to take over. It's not going to, you know, start to power the entire country. But I think people would be surprised just about how much uh, landfill gas could actually contribute to the energy needs of the country, wouldn't you say? I, I agree with that. Um, I, I would like for somebody to do that study, some universities say, you know, we've got all this available energy that's here already, um, and that we can, if we can capture that energy and use it, how much of that will 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 add to our you know reserves in the US for not only for uh, uh, defense reasons but just because we need that in our reserves or ca- and, and um, yeah so I I would like for that to happen and I suspect that's going to happen uh, in short order some some university or college will probably get a fund from somebody <laughs> and, and they'll, they'll uh, do a study for us. But I mean, at the end of the day, this idea of renewable natural gas, we are taking something that has historically been a problem for a couple of reasons. Uh, all of this methane, all of this uh, hydrogen sulfide being released from our landfills. And not only are we dealing with that problem, we are turning it into a positive. We are, cr- we are turning a problem into a solution for multiple other problems. So... Like it's, it's really hard to see a downside, uh, aside from the initial capital required to begin the process, it's really kind of hard to see a downside to uh, to going all in on this, I would say. Uh, you, you're, again, you're right. And, and, and one of the things it does do is that we educate our population. And what I mean by that is, as the, the households better understand what happens to their waste. Uh, they will better manage their waste. And so if somebody changed or changes their oil at home, their car oil, they know better than to throw that in a dumpster or whatever, put it in a can and throw it out. No, you should collect that and use it by taking it to your local landfill and they have typically hazardous sites at all these landfills where you can just drop it off. Good communities allow allow its residents just to drop off these types of waste. And, uh, and so I think the more we do this, the better our population understands just how much they can contribute by better managing their waste. Awesome. Uh, Well, I think you've given uh, everybody a lot to think about. So I just want to thank you so much for joining me today and talking about renewable natural gas and where you think it's going in the future. Uh, Again, uh, Ramon Rivera, CEO of Diamond Scientific. If you want to see everything that they have going on, make sure to visit them online at diamondsci.com, diamondsci.com. Call them at 321-223-7500. Zero, zero. Again, sir, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Eric. All right, guys, we'll see you back next week with another episode of Recyclist.